I've put together four reports right now, uh, over 65 articles. And I've always had in mind that you have to have some kind of contribution from the people who you're writing it about. Now, to bring the talk to the kids idea into a classroom setting, uh, and uh, Steve Wagler is here, uh, who's uh, a part of Scholar Century, but there's something that one of his staff members told me, uh, who is a former teacher. She said that she was teaching in the class and there was a young black male in the class who couldn't stay awake during her class. And constantly, she would look back and he would be doing this. And she said it really got to it. It made her feel uh, some sort of animosity towards this kid because how dare he sleep in my class? What does he think, I'm boring? Is he being disrespectful? So she decided rather than sit on this resentment without complete information, why don't I talk to him and just let him know, listen, I think it's disrespectful that you're sleeping in my class. Uh, what's going on with you that you can't stay awake? And then she found out that a couple of weeks ago, his daughter's mother, he had a, a baby girl, brought the girl to his house and said, I can't do it anymore. So he had the baby daughter in his home, and he was working in Walmart to help to support this kid. And so he was coming to school a little tired. So after that conversation, two things happened. One, he tried hard to stay awake because he knew that someone cared about his well-being. And two, she saw him pushing up. She was more focused on him pushing up than the head dropping down. So talking to the kids can change our entire dialogue. There's a sister principal that I met in Chicago, and he told me after I gave a presentation, and in that presentation I told them that nationwide, the black males who are being suspended by and large are not the most dangerous kids. They're not the most disobedient kids. These are the kids that have the learning disorders or learning disabilities. And they're also kids who lack a certain type of academic etiquette. So they do things like come to school late, or they may hand in assignments late. So he told me, he said, you know, I can't dispute what you said because in my school, our number one reason for suspending kids is for coming to school late. And he said, I don't get it because they come to school late and we suspend them. So, They'll come to school late again. Then they will suspend them again. Then they come to school late again. We suspend them again. They keep doing what? Come to school late. So he said, could you tell me what to do about this? And I told him, well, the first thing you can do is ask them why they're coming to school late. And he said, huh. I never thought about that. <laughs> Talk to the kids, right? I'm modeling my shoes. When we think about the walk to a school, and this is connected to the one who, who didn't think it was appropriate, or didn't really think of talking to a kid about why they come to school late. In one of my research reports, I found that young black males who walk to school have the highest level of anxiety about dangers in their communities. So it's typically the kids in the most impoverished settings who are walking to school the most. What we find in that is that a lot of young black males, or a lot of kids in general, on that walk to the school, they may have to pass through some dangerous areas. They may have to take on certain responsibilities like taking one of their siblings to kindergarten. They may have to do a lot of different things before they get to school. And when they walk into the school, what do they need from us? Well, I'll tell you what they don't need. They don't need a security officer mean mugging them as soon as they walk in the door. They don't need to pass through a metal detector and have their cell phone set off the alarm and the security officer look at them like he has contraband, patting them down. They don't need their teachers stereotyping them because of what they have heard about the environment, so they're treating them with less respect and less deference. What they need is someone to listen to them. They need someone to talk to them. 
The title of all of my shoes came from a writing contest that I was a judge of when I was working on my first Breaking Barriers report. It was a writing contest that was established by an author named Cleo Scott Brown. And she decided that instead of listening to the news media's reports about young black males, she wanted to hear from young black males herself. She wasn't an academic, she wasn't a researcher, she wasn't a teacher, she was a concerned citizen who said, I'm going to put up $100 and have a writing contest. And whoever writes the best essay, as is judged by my panel of judges, will get that money. And she got essays from all across the nation for a relatively small price. I read those essays while I was working on my first Breaking Marriage Report. One of the quotes from there is something that I quote quite a bit. That quote is, what about to be seen as a person with a name then poof, a statistic, a memory, and too many, a shame? What about to be seen as a person with a name then poof, a statistic, a memory, and too many, a shame? That was Dr. Asa Flood, or Mr. Asa Flood. He's only in college right now. He was the one who wrote that. I actually invited him to be a part of this panel. Another thing that I remember reading in those essays is being a young black man is a blessing that people have tried to make a curse. Another thing that I read in there, and it's in the report that I handed out today, young black male said, teachers do more than just teach content. They stand as models for what it's like to be an educated person. They also serve as surrogate parents, guides, and mentors to young people. If students are to believe that they may one day be educated people, who can make a positive contribution to society, they need to see diverse examples. That wasn't the professor that wrote that. That was in 11th grade. So what are we missing out on by not having the kind of conversations with these young black males about what they need? So today it's time to start a different type of conversation with young black males. But I think we have to first start that conversation off with an apology. Mm. We need to apologize for constantly saying things like there are more black men in prison than in college. For quoting a stat that's 10 years old that even the people who wrote it originally concede to the fact that it's not true today. We have to apologize for ignoring at least five reports that have been written in that 10 years that has refuted that, but, have, but we have decided to hang on to that line because we think that it makes for good speech. We have to apologize for constantly saying that 50% of black males are dropping out and not clarifying that the graduation rate and the dropout rate are two different things. And just because a young black male doesn't graduate with their cohort doesn't mean that they've dropped out of school and that the true rate is really something more like 18%, which is still far too high, but it's not 50%. It is not to say that one in two of our young black men are dropping out. We have to apologize for constantly saying things like black men are a dying breed, that they're at the point of extinction, and that they're an endangered species, because breed, species, and extinct are terms reserved only for black men and animals. We have to apologize for using assessments to stigmatize our young black males and not being able to separate a test from the test taker and not being able to really realize the creative genius that's in a lot of young black males who don't test well. We have to apologize for constantly calling them at risk to their face and behind their back. Because these are kids who have the potential to be anything that they want to be. So with that, I will step off the soapbox and turn it over to the people you all came to see. First, I want to bring up Mr. Tommy Walls, give him a big hand of round of applause from Marquette University, the junior at Marquette University, and as I call his name, he's from the stage. Next, I'm going to bring up 
the up and coming Asa Hilliard, Asa Flood, who's a senior at Marion University in South Carolina. Next, I want to bring up Demarius Jury Mesmer. What high school you represent? I'm sorry, it's not on my notes. And Mesmer? Okay, that's not your last name, that's your high school. My last name is Jury. Okay, sorry about that. All right, from Mesmer High School. Next, I want to bring up Darius Scott. Michael Taylor at Benjamin High School. And last, certainly not least, is Jeremy Treblet, who is an education and training coordinator for Urban Underground, who has been so instrumental to what we've done today. All right. So let's start off just by having all of you all introduce yourself, uh, just uh, say your name, uh, where you're from and in general, what you think is important for us to understand about young black men today. And just, just make that very brief, because I have a lot of other more specific questions. We can start with Again, my name is Tommy Walls. I'm a junior at Marquette University, studying social welfare and justice I'm here in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, what I would like to say about uh, one thing that you, you should know about tonight and black men in general is that uh, we do have a purpose and uh, we know we are here for a purpose, but we need your help in understanding what that purpose is. Good evening, my name is Asa Flood, and I am from Pineville, South Carolina. Um, you probably never heard of Pineville, so you've probably heard of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I go to Francis Marion University in Florence, South Carolina, and I would think one of the things that people need to understand about black males are that you should not write us off so quick. We have so much potential, we have so many things that we have to do for our community and that we can continue to go on and become successful people. Thank you. Um, I'm Demarius Jury. Um, I'm a senior at Mesmer High School and I'm a part of Urban Underground, the second year program. Surgeon at Arms um, is my title there. One thing I would like for you all to know is that youth voice is powerful, especially in young black males. Um, it's a difference between listening and hearing. And I believe that if you all hear us, the movement will be powerful. My name is Darius Scott. Um, I'm 17, I go to Vincent High School, and I'm also part of the second year program at Urban Underground. And one thing I would want to say about us black youth is that the first thought that comes to your mind should not be the first thing that comes out your mouth. Hey everybody, my name is Jeremy. Um, I'm a program coordinator for Urban Underground. And I think the first thing that I want everyone to know about being a black man is that you shouldn't talk about us if we're not at the table. Okay, how's that to get us started? All right, so the first question I want to throw out there, and anybody who, who wants to answer it can. Um, recently, there's been a lot of um, negative press about young black males. Uh, a lot of it is couched in, in science and statistics. Uh, others is um, just portrayals on the, on the evening news. Uh, so, what I'd like to know is, one, how do you feel about the way that black men and boys are portrayed in the media? And also, do you believe that the media influences the way that black males behave? And do you think that, and are, do you think that it influences uh, teachers and other adults' perceptions of young black males? So, anybody who has a response to that can go. I guess I'll take a stab at it first. That's a really good question. I think the media is stuck in a lot of ways. Um, as I begin to do research and talk to young men, I think that one thing I think is that the media is for entertainment. 
The problem is that for black people, it's been at our expense. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to the media, I don't, I don't allow the words that come off for entertainment tonight, let alone 12 o'clock news, to hold any weight in my life because I understand because I work with the young people. It's not, it's not a mirror of the black man's life. It's a massage. And so when you start talking about the influence that it has on black behavior, black male behavior, it's interesting because every generation that we have, the young people emulate what's popular. But on the inside, they know what's right. And I think that we gotta start giving credit where credit is due. A lot of young black men have home training. And the majority that you see on the media aren't the ones who we see every day on the block. I work with a lot of young black men who if you saw them from a distance, you would say, oh, he must be this. He must be smoking weed. He must be sitting somebody's car, but he ain't got no interest in doing none of that. He might be stuck in a system that's trying to make him go for that. And so that's kind of how the behavior is influenced. Sometimes you have to respond to the situation you're in. But we should be categorized by our mistakes either. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And, and, uh, And I'm glad you brought up the, the fact that we really do have to get to know somebody before we judge them. Because, you know, I, I have family members who used to have to dress like Bloods and Crips mm -hmm. just because of the neighborhood that they lived in. And, and I remember asking them, well, why don't you just wear neutral colors? And they said, you just don't understand. <laughs> you know, so you may be looking at somebody who looks like a gang member, but when you talk to them, you realize they're just doing that out of survival, that they have no you know, they, they, they don't want to sell drugs, they don't want to engage in any violence, they're just doing, uh, doing that on their own survival. Hey, anybody else have a, a thought about the media? Yeah, I'm not a young black male, but... I'm not a young black male, but I'm so glad you asked that question because uh, I had a really, an experience that really blew my mind with respect to the media. I had a young black male who was a senior in high school who was a National Honor Society student uh, and had won a four-year scholarship to the University of Wisconsin-Madison as a star football player and won my congressional art competition. So I could not pitch this story to the press. I could not pitch it to any of the media, because here was a young black man who wasn't gangbanging. I mean, he was, a, he was a scholar, an athlete, and an artist. And then, several years later, four years later, he was recruited by the St. Louis Rams. Um, but I, I couldn't pitch that story to anybody. I finally got the black press, because my son was working there at the time, to publish the story about his achievement. But yeah. You know, they, they didn't want that story. I would like to first say that when it comes to the media, first, the media is a business. That was me and um, Tommy was talking about, the fact that it is a business. And one of the things that, you know, Mr. Jeremy said is the fact that it is at our expense. When we look at history as in terms of entertainment and everything like that, we look at um, our times of going through menstrual shows where we are imitated. I mean, where, um, white, where white people imitated us. And now they don't need to do that no more because we are the ones playing in that menstrual show. Mm -hmm. And once again, it's a shame. And one of the things we could do is wonder how could we shift what is on the media to what is Main Street? How to focus on the everyday heroes, such as our doctors, our teachers, our parents, who work day to day to strive for each and every, every black male in our community. And I think that's more so the question. How could we shift that media to Main Street? Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah. For, for, the, for the high school young men, um, I, I think there's a lot of anxiety among older people that some of the rappers that we see, you know, Lil Wayne and 2 Chainz and you know, people like that. I know I'm old when I can say 2 Chainz and it's funny just because <laughs> and, and, and I think, you know, a lot of adults are concerned that 
you know, that, that those types of influences, and you know, especially when we hear what they what they're saying, could negatively influence youth. And so, is that unfounded, or do you think that 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 they actually do have a negative uh, influence? The way media portrays black males, I believe, are like polygamous, and it's, it's not good per se because most are not, you know, gang banging and. Um, having several sexual partners or however way the media portrays it, it's more dependent on the intellect of the person that's watching it because if you all have a, a brain and a mind to know and understand the fact that um, even though this is on TV, this is not that person. This is a modernized form of um, blackface, really, if you would think about it. It's all in the hands of the person who owns that network or it all goes back to that. And I feel that it all starts with the youth because once you educate them and let them know that, and if you let them know what what is being portrayed on TV is not them and not will be them, it, it, it will change, I okay. believe. Good, good, all right. Yeah. I just feel that the media, like I said, it is a, a business, and it's just, it's kind of, black males are looking for attention, and if you show that violence is the way they can get attention, they will act out violence because they know that's how they get people. And also, just based off of like music and things like that, um, artists make music based off their community. And if the community is extremely violent at the time, they know people will respond to what they are, and not always what they are, but the way that they're portrayed, and if they're not shown that they're not that, then they will respond the way that they're told they are. So that's just how I think it's important. Music is a, a universal understanding. Um, everyone has a genre that they may like, whether the blues, rap, or jazz. Um, but we have to get to the point where violence is not a universal understanding. Um, music attracts us, attracts our ears, we like to listen to it, we can have fun with it. Um, and violence is something where you can also get attention. You kill three people, you're automatically on the news. Now, evidently, somebody is listening to you. Somebody is hearing you. Somebody is paying attention to the things that you're doing. But when you're having a panel full of, full of young black men, I'm not seeing a lot of reporters here today. And so what do we have to do to get attention, to let our community know that we're trying, that we're succeeding, and that everything that we're trying to do, all we need is support, and not to write us off really quickly. So the music industry definitely has an influence on our black community. Um, whether male or female, but I would definitely say that we need to teach um, our youth and we need to teach ourselves that what we see on TV should not be imitated. All right. All the reporters in the room raise their hand. All the people blog raise their hand. All the people tweet raise their hand. All right, we need you all to put this stuff out so we can. Right. One of the things I also want to mention with the fact of music and everything is going back to a time in the 1920s, 1930s, when the Harlem Renaissance was a very important era for African Americans. We had people like Langston Hughes and, you know, James Baldwin, who, you know, wrote and thought outside the box. And as we continue to go on through the 40s and 50s, we have, you know, dancers like Alvin Ali and we have Billie Holiday, who expressed from the soul how they really felt. They didn't have a record industry to tell them what to sing or what not to sing. And now it's to the extent that, you know, with that message that they brought, even down to Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, which is one of my favorite songs that I listen to all the time, is the fact that they could say that, but once people realize that this is the message that is being heard within our community to upraise and uplift our community, there had to be a stop to that. Yeah. 
And I really believe that's what it was. And so I, we can say that you know the media has portrayed us in a, in a bad light, but then again, we have to go back to how can we go back to thinking outside the box, that allowing our talents to convey how we really feel and who we are and create that dialogue. All right, good, good. Let's move on to the next question. So studies show that young black males do better in school when they feel good about themselves. So what can schools do to support more positive feelings and attitudes among young black males? Um, I personally feel that from my own experience that coming into school feeling really good about yourself will make your school day better. Um, and most of the time, me and my fellow classmates, we do come in feeling very good. And then we walk through the doors and it's just a feeling of despair. You don't want to be in this building. You feel the building doesn't care for you as much as you should, as it should, as the people inside the building should. And like when you walk in, in my school, we walk through security. And when we walk through security, the security is very mean looking. Um, you walk in and they look like they don't want you to be there. They look like they expect you to act a certain way as soon as you walk in through that door. And when you walk in feeling good and you see that, yo, mindset flips completely because now you're on the defensive. And now you're thinking, okay, I have to be quiet, don't act a fool, and just go through the day as fast as I can. And when you go through the school day and you have teachers sitting there and your teachers don't want to be there themselves, you really don't want to be there. And when your teachers are teaching you subjects that they don't know about, it's even worse. And it just, it, if we don't know about it, and you don't know about it, but we know more about it than you do, I feel there's some kind of disconnection of data there. So. Wow. Wow. I think I need a moment on that one. But I mean, but that, that's, a, that's, that's what I've been preaching. I mean, and I'm... I need that video, because <laughs> I, I need to upload that to YouTube. And I need to blast that out to a lot of people. Thank, thank you for that. Um, any other comments on, on that? And, and we, 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 he did a very good job of telling us about the situation as it is right now. Uh, anybody have any opinions about what needs to change, like what you would like to see at the school that would, that would change the way you feel? I think one thing that we have to do in school is, um, well, actually, I saw, I saw something on YouTube, and uh, it was talking about the way education was going for this generation of young people. And it started talking about how, when they first began to form, when they first began to form public schools, they formed them with the, with the mindset that these young people had farms to attend to. And so they began to stop schools from working out in the, in the summertime um, and did so in the fall because the summertime was harvest, right? And so they began to set up the school system in, in a way where you would know what it's like to work in the factory. And so we shift you from sale to sale, categorized with different names like math and science, and we allow you to mark high on the test as if you would if you were in the factory. Well, I was born after the factories left. So for me, it doesn't work. Actually, nothing about the society that I live in looks like that. School might be the only place that young people go for the majority of their lifetime that looks nothing like what they do when they get out. We're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, we're on everything else. We're making our own websites, and they got you on a whiteboard. What are you doing standing in front of a whiteboard? We, we are our own media. And then they always talk about how we know more about our favorite rapper, and we can quote their line, but we can't quote poetry that we learned from American English. Well, I didn't hear you teach it because I was asleep. And that's just the truth. Right. If you want to begin to support not only black boys, but our generation, you got to kind of get with the times a little bit. You got to begin to say, okay, well, what are the good things in this generation that we can use to teach our young people with? You can't blame us for using the media the wrong way if you didn't even provide a good example. There's amazing ways where you can teach young people how to learn, and you can still use media, and it can benefit us for the rest of our lives. Push. Push. 
Persistence until success happens. There have been often, there, there's been many times which I've seen that we don't have enough passion, passionate teachers in our schools. Um, it's clear that when someone is struggling, when someone isn't understanding or um, is not comprehending that article that needs to be read in the classroom, a teacher shoes them away and automatically forgets that they're even in the classroom. And then once that student does something that bothers them, the referral automatically comes up because the teacher is unhappy. Not necessarily thinking about, well, what is this student going to be missing if I suspend him? Just a little fact now to put out there. I read um, in the Journal Sentinel not too long ago that um, Milwaukee Public Schools have suspended more, um, have given out more suspensions than the NPS enrollment as a whole. <laughs> Yeah. And honestly, um, in that article, NPS made um, an incorrect, actually saying that they suspended 12,000 students when actually it was 24,000. And they are still paying for that mistake today. So why are we suspending our students? Is it because we don't want them in our hair? Is it because we can and we have the authority to and no one's going to ask any questions? So we need to be persistent and being patient on our youth and understanding that, hey, when you come in here, you come in a classroom, you don't understand, I'm gonna be there with you every step of the way. And that goes for you and the rest of the 29 of you in this classroom. So we definitely need more passionate teachers. I'm not sure how we're gonna get that, but that's definitely how we need them. Being an education major and having so many mentors who have been teachers, I must say that I had my, my share of teachers who have been very compassionate and then the ones that were like, eh, you know, I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about them. I can, there's a whole lot of different words I can say. But one of the things, <laughs> but one of the things I remember going into my 11th grade year was going into U.S. History AP. And AP classes are not very much big. There's not many people who go get enrolled into that course. And I remember having one recommendation from a teacher who continued to believe that I plagiarized all my work. And if there's any time that I had to correct her for spelling a word wrong, she got angry and disappointed. But it's not that. It's just the fact that, you know, I want you to understand that I know what I'm talking about, too. And that's just all it is. But when I got that recommendation and my teacher, Ms. Soul, showed me, she was like, Asa, I want you to see this. She was like, it said, Asa is not able to pass a class like this. He does not have the capabilities of passing a class like this. And even though I've struggled and continue to work, Ms. Soul had made me realize that, Asa, you can do this. You can do this. At the end of that class, I was the only one who passed that AP exam. And it was on all because of her, I feel like. I can't even say it was because of me. I just give all of my humility and thanks to her. And it just comes back into real, I mean, to realization that once as I look at, you know, the high school students, I remember as I go into a high school, I mean, go into my school, and I feel as if I am a war, I am in a war against everybody. And I'm not saying just as far as teachers and administrators, but my peers as well. Because they feel as if, okay, well, why is he dressing up? Why is he being so involved? It's a war within yourself that you have to continue to fight more and more each day. And it gets draining. And nobody, and I would never wish it on anybody. But one of the things that I continue to tell high school students is just to keep on persevering and keep on pushing through. And even if you have to correct your teacher or tell your teacher how you're feeling, 
create that dialogue. Create your dialogue between the people who feel as if they are, I mean, you are better than them. Say, like, I'm not. I'm here right alongside with you. And you have the same opportunity as me. How many teachers do we have in here today? All right. I want to thank all of you all for being here. Uh, and, and you heard Asa talk about uh, Miss Soli. That's a uh, uh, soul. Miss Melissa Soli. Right? Uh, and I remember reading about Miss Melissa Soli in his essay about four years ago. Uh, and actually, the last article that I wrote for the Root, I mentioned what he said about Miss Soli. Uh, and then I, I, I did a Google search of Miss Soli, and she was featured in this news documentary. Uh, I saw a picture of her, and, and I actually emailed the school and, and, uh, and thanked her for what she did, you know, what she's doing for our young black males. And, um, and you know, this is, a, this, this is a, 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 a Caucasian woman, you know, so uh, you don't have to be the same race, you don't have to be the same gender to make that impact. Uh, but teachers, they just do so much, and they, they, they really hold the keys to this. And I, I mean, I have a, a story similar to, to Asa's, where when I was in fifth grade, uh, there was a teacher who was convinced that I was a slow learner. And, and it, was, it was obvious that she didn't think that my capacity to learn was what the other students were. There was a, a private school. Uh, my behavior continued to get worse and worse in that school. So my mother took me out of that school and just put me in the public school. And the teacher in the public school uh, just thought that I was the most gifted student that she ever met. And so, and I'm thinking, you know, am I dense or am I gifted? I don't know. <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, I probably was, you know, I could have been either one, because I was only in fifth grade. I could have been dense or I could have been gifted. It really just depended on the teacher's expectation. And that's what we have to think about. When we look at our classes, we don't know which one is going to be the next doctor this, the next the next uh, representative in the House of Representatives, you know, we, we, we don't know who's going to be that. So we might as well make the assumption that any of them could and treat them all accordingly. All right, the next question I want to ask, studies show that black males who do better, in, uh, black males do better in school when they are rested, when they get a full night's sleep, eight to nine hours, when they have a diet that consists of healthy foods, vegetables, fruits, do you agree with that? And if so, what do you think are some of the obstacles of black males engaging in the healthiest behaviors that they could possibly engage in? When I um, came to Milwaukee, um, and actually my cousin and my guardians are here in the back. You wait a minute. Um, they raised me until, um, well, they're still raising me, but I got out of the house <laughs> when I went to college at 18. And um, before I got to Milwaukee, I did not have a healthy diet. Um, it was fried foods, it was uh, chicken, fries, and more chicken, potatoes every day. So straight carbs, 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 carbs. Um, no vegetables. Um, and that was okay for me. However, I didn't sleep well. Um, there was always ruckus in the house on top of it. Um, so it definitely bothered my sleeping habits. Um, and I believe uh, when I moved to Milwaukee, I definitely had a variety of vegetables and fruits. Um, the carbs and you know proteins and vitamin A and vitamin C and all those things that uh, makes you healthy. And I definitely think uh, providing that to our young men, especially um, to be intellectual individuals, I think um, it's imperative uh, for a quality education. Yeah. Okay. Really yeah. Any of the high school students want to respond to that? <laughs> 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 um, so. <laughs> Resting is, yeah, it, it really is important. That that is big, but that eating healthy that that goes for everyone, not just black males. That is right. for every race, age, um, and females also, not just black males. That's for anybody. Um, what I think could change that is the fact that how how it is set up in the system. It's these things called food deserts, where most of us live in, where we can't get fresh, attainable vegetables and fruits in our um, nearby grocery stores or or gardens. It's not it's not in our areas. We can't if we can't get the materials we need or to eat a healthy diet. Then how possibly?
can they expect for us to do so? <laughs> That's what I, I really don't understand now. Yeah. Good point. Um, just a couple points. One, I think eight to nine hours is unrealistic. I don't remember the last time I had eight to nine hours of sleep in on a norm. Like, the norm for me is maybe five hours. It is based not just off home life. Um, I don't do school homework, but I know that when I did do school homework that it is a lot. It is a lot that you can't even finish in school and then we bring home. I've stood up to maybe 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, trying to finish homework. And I just feel that it's an unrealistic number. And also the diet part, um, at home we don't have like, because we live in food deserts, as Demarge pointed out, we live in food, desert, food deserts. And it's just, especially at school, it's not real food. Um, if they want us to eat fresh food, why wouldn't they provide us fresh food where we're at most of the day? You know, at school, the best food don't look like it. It's just, the bread isn't bread. It's just, it's a lot of things that aren't real and we eat it because it's the only thing we have. And most of the times I feel better in the morning than I do after I eat lunch. And it's, I think it's because of the food. And we can't have a diet if we're at most of the day isn't healthy food to me. So I think that just makes the day worse. So I will take that message back to Washington, D.C. and work with Michelle Obama and everybody and try to make these changes that she's recommending. All right, so the next question. Students' future plans have a big impact on their success in school. Uh, how did you learn about your options after high school and your career opportunities? And what are some ways that schools, so what are some things that schools can do to better prepare black males for college or other post-secondary opportunities? When I was in high school, of course I mentioned the soul, but I also had um, different mentors, such as my guidance counselor, who continued to tell me about different varieties of colleges that I could go to. Um, as far as right now, you know, I continue, I've changed my major plenty of times. And in between, when I was in high school, I think I wanted to be a dentist, a politician, and then a teacher. And one of the things that, you know, that even though if I changed my mind, I still had that support. They was not, they were not quick to say like, okay, well you changed your mind so much, you know, I'm not gonna follow you. They still follow behind you. And so whatever your future plan is, it is not gonna come right then and there, but it will, it always fall into place. And so um, with that being said, I would say if you continue to go around, I mean, if teachers continue to go around and say, okay, these are the things that you could do. I want to take you out to a college tour or a campus visit. Let me take you to the engineering firm or the law firm so you can see people who are just like you, just like you or who have been in your shoes. Make it and show that you could do it as well. That's one thing. Um, just a couple points. Um, one, from my perspective of learning about college, I learned I didn't know what college was from school. School didn't tell me what college was. I learned what college was outside of school. Um, all the programs I've been outside of school told me how to get to college, how to prepare to co for college, and things like that. Um, one thing that would um, help that be better is, um, one, my guidance counselor doesn't know my name. And I've gone to the school my whole high school education. Um, I'm a junior right now, so. And I've had the same guidance counselor since freshman year. And she doesn't know my name. I know her name though. <laughs> and when she doesn't know, I think like when I ask her about colleges, she can't tell me any college that connects with my interests. Um, and two, in the classroom, teachers don't know what is going on in the community now. Um, People don't tell other students that you can have a job based off what you're doing now. Um, people, teachers don't tell you that you like to rap, but there's other things that have to do with music that you can do. There's sound producers, things like that. Um, when you sit there and take apart a phone in front of your teacher, your teacher doesn't tell you that there's engineers that do this. 
um, when you like food and you're sitting there and you're writing down recipes, they don't tell you that you get a job off of that. And when teachers don't know what's going on themselves, it makes it even worse because they don't know what they're talking about. And if they can't educate you on what you need the education on, then college doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Keeping it real up in here, keeping it real. Um, um, one thing that I stress to most of my teachers often is the fact that most schools put in their curriculum things that are frivolous, things that don't pertain to the student whatsoever and will make the student take the class. Um, being a senior, you will um, take up most of your classes and took them already, so they put you in, um, what is it called? Electives, thank you, I'm sorry. They put you in electives, and um, electives might not pertain to you whatsoever. And I think that they need to add in curriculum th um, things that will matter to the student. Teachers should be trained, period, um, to see what a student is passionate about regardless and add that into their curriculum. Because um, I know a lot of people at my school who want to do music, but there is limited music classes. It's, it's a choir class, but what is that going to do? I think teachers need to be trained to see um, the potential of students and to see um, their passion, what they're passionate about, and specifically put that student in their classes and get them ready. And, I can't generally speak for Mesmer because Mesmer is a, is a college professor, so they shove college down your throat. <laughs> um, so I wish I could say what Derry said. My guidance counselor knows me. She put me out of class every day, and I'm ready. But it's college is serious. And I wish that um, most schools add that into their curriculum, and maybe the outcome will change. Mm -hmm. I know the outcome. Right. Yeah, yeah, that, that's very important. You know, one of the things that we know from the research is that a lot of black males aren't given proper guidance, uh, and there are there are black males with the credentials to go to four-year universities, good competitive four-year universities, but uh, depending on the school that they're at, they may still be advised to go to a community college. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we definitely need to to, to broaden that. I know for me, um, I never once met my guidance counselor. Um, I knew who she was because I was interested in the Marines. And the Marines had to come and talk to her in order to get to me. So I met her through a Marine. Um, that being said, for me, I didn't want to go to college right after high school. I knew that if I had a win, I would have never had enough money. I knew that my mind wasn't focused. But I also was too nervous to tell anybody. It was almost like a well-kept secret for some reason, as if there are no other opportunities in the world. And I think that schools need to understand that just like everybody doesn't respond to a traditional education, everybody might not take a traditional route. And I think that the traditional route should be redefined to be the route that gets you to your success. For me, I went to public allies. And that's an um, AmeriCorps program that put me in Urban Underground. And that's where I work today. And so for me, I go to work and I go to school at the same time. That's my education. I'm, I can, I'm allowed to do things. And I've got experiences and I've spoken to people and I've spoken on different panels and different things of that nature that you have to pay to somebody to have you do and get a degree to do. I'm not knocking degrees. I think that everybody should get one. But what I'm saying is not having one doesn't define who you are. I was talking to a parent the other day, and the parent was, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a young person who is a junior now, and they go to a young black man, and he's a junior, and he goes to a private school. But he, this is his first year at that private school. And he came from a school down south that was public, and it was about to close down. And so they worked hard to get him into that school, but his grades don't reflect someone who goes to that school. And the issue was that they felt like he wasn't doing enough. He wasn't working hard enough. But he was working on the weekends and throughout the week at least four hours a night, every day after school. And so my question was to them, I said, well, how hard do you think you need to push him? And they said, we gotta push him harder. I said, well, you don't want his failures to define who he is as a man, do you? 
Because the truth is, everybody's not an A student. And we know that everybody doesn't have to be an A student in order to be an amazing person or a success. The truth also is, is that in that first report card of him going to that school as a junior for the first time, it might not look like everybody else's. Because once again, he came from a school that was being closed down because of the grades that they got. And so we have to begin to be patient with young people in regards to their grades and help them understand that just because you didn't get a 3.5 your whole time doesn't mean you can't go to places like Marquette and UWM. Right. Isn't that a lie? And so number one, because I like to be solution based, one, let's start getting more counselors who actually come equipped with the resources to lead and guide you. And then let's also have teachers begin to talk about and put into our minds, planting the seeds, that our young people should go to higher education. Let me show you what it looks like. It could be a program, it could be a college, a university, but stop putting the bar so low that you only say, well, let's go to community college. And I'm not saying it's low because they aren't good enough. I'm saying it's low because in my mind, when I go through our high school, I thought being at a university was the best thing you could possibly do. But I'm only good enough for a community college. That's the message. And so we have to shift the message and so our young people know that the options are there and that they'll work in your favor. And also, let them know how hard it is to actually apply for college. That was one of the hardest things that our young people have to go through every day. Applying for scholarships, they might be some for who's a less favorite person and who's taller than six feet, but doing the work on top of the work that you're already doing can be taxing. Um, and so I just appreciate all the programs out there who go from the private colleges. But be honest and realistic with them too. Um, so how do you deal with peer pressure? Peer pressure, because we know that uh, as young young males, there's a lot of pressures to be involved with drinking, uh, underage drinking, drug use, um, sexual behaviors. Uh, so how do you navigate uh, those types of, of uh, pressures? Who is our All right. Well, first I would say that I am a college student, and I am a human. And so um, I would say throughout my four years of being at Francis Marion University that I was not always the, you know, the model vice president of SGA or the president of Alpha Alpha Fraternity. I wasn't always that. I made my mistakes. And one of the things that I could say for the most part is the fact that I own up to it. And that's just one of the most important things that we all need to do is to own up to everything that we have done. Learn from it, reflect from it. Was that a good move, was that a bad move? Wake up in the morning, you probably will have, I mean, I'm not sure if you know, I don't want you know, high schools to think about this or anything, but when you have a hangover, you know, okay, was that the best thing for you to do when you know you have a paper due in a few hours? <laughs> it's true, and it happens all the time. But you know what, I think peer pressure is one of the best lessons. The best lessons. Yes, it can be a negative impact to black males, but most importantly, if you learn from it and you realize that, gosh, I messed up, I need to do better and get back on your game, then you can move on and become better. And you can tell somebody who is coming in not to do that. If I were you, I mean, you could do whatever you want, but understand that these things have consequences. And the consequences could range from death to having a child that you're not ready for, <coughs> having an STD. These things happen, and these things are very much real. So focus on the effects and once you're done with that, realize, okay, what you have done wrong or what you have done right and continue to go on with your life. Do not dwell on your past. But peer pressure is more of an issue when you don't have anybody in your corner letting you know that it was peer pressure. Right. Because when you don't have people in your corner, then it becomes a reality. And it becomes an ongoing issue. You continue to drown yourself in your sorrow. You continue to drown yourself in your insecurities. You continue to drown yourself in the people that said that they would be there for you, but have not. And the solution to this problem would be mentors.
parents, community members, community leaders, people who are active in your community and in your life to let you know that, hmm, you probably shouldn't have did that. Or what do you think about this now, now that it's over? Having people in your corner um, having you understand the things that you've done and the consequences for your actions. But there are a lot of um, young black males who um, take on this peer pressure also because of pride. I'm a man. My, my dad said I'm a man. My mom said I'm a man. That whole man feeling, feeling like I can do anything that I want and no one's gonna stop me. But really what I've learned is pride can really get you in trouble. And so having those people near you every step of the way, like I said before, such so as teachers, mentors, and people who are there active in your lives will let you know that peer pressure is something that you can go through. Uh, Jeremy, you can answer this one first. Uh, black males are more likely to be arrested and serve time in the juvenile justice system. Uh, why do you think this is, and what do you think society can do to reduce the number of black males who, who are involved in the juvenile justice system? Mm, that's a pretty wild question. Um, I think the first thing I think about is, I think about uh, the environment that young black males are in. Uh, it's interesting because me and my co-worker were walking into school one day, and when we walk into the school, and we, we're not scared of young people, we love young people, uh, they're brilliant people. But if you put anybody in the wrong environment, they can become dangerous. And we walked into school, and I promise you, it was terrible. All we were trying to do was get a meeting with the principal. We walked into school, and the bell had rang, and young people were running throughout the hallways like it was a zoo and teachers are running after them. Security guards watching, they like ribbing each other. You got somebody over here who cuts somebody out. This person not paying attention. And then the entrance to the office was locked. You had to unlock it, and then you got locked in there. What? <laughs> Only to meet the principal, and the principal goes, I don't have time right now, I'm too busy. And then we're dialoguing with the young people, and they're telling us they don't know us. It's our first visit. Man, I hate this school. This school is so unorganized. This school get on my last nerves. They argue with each other. People banging on the window. What? So once again, it's the environment. A lot of times we prepare young people to be in jail because we're stressing them all the way out for eight hours a day, five days a week. And so that juvenile system, that school to prison pipeline is real. It's real. And it exists outside of school before you get there. It exists after school. And so I think that the policies that, that are put in place, I think what we have to come to grips with is that the, the school to prison pipeline system can be intentional in a lot of ways. This is economics we're talking about. Your behavior equates to me getting more money for you being in the city. That's what that equates to. How do, we, how, do we, how do we spend more money on you being locked up and you going to college? It feels good to our pockets and it looks bad. And so I think that it's real. And I think that what we have to do is, we have to, parents have to get more active and going to the school. Please get more active. It's a lot of parents, and I know firsthand, they don't have a clue as to what their young person is going through in school. As a matter of fact, the young person comes home and they don't have a conversation about what's going on in school. And so your, your young person could be on their way to a prison cell because they have too much time. They can skip out and go to the hallway or go over here and have sex or go over here and smoke weed or go over here. Or they might get suspended and not come home until after you get there because you want third shift so you never know. So parents, please get involved. That support system outside of that school building can be the world of a difference. There's so many young people who need support, it's not funny. And then you also have to stop labeling young people. Young people who get labeled are more likely to end up in jail because people treat them like they deserve to go to jail. These young, these young men are being called ADHD, all these other letters in the alphabet, AAD, DDA, 
all these different stuff that you call them these young people. Nobody don't understand what the names are, nothing like that. And then you give them an IEP and you treat them like they deserve to be special. I'll give an example. We were at a school recruiting. And we were in the lunch room, and lunch is over. And in between the lunch hour, there's this guy that comes in. He could have been a junior, maybe. And one of his legs was disabled, so it kind of dragged behind him as he walked. And he sat down at the table after he had a package from us, and he was reading it. This is in between lunch hours. So of course, the security guard comes in, and he's trying to get him out. But the conversation between them is crazy. The security guard goes, hey man, I done told you to stop coming out my lunch hour after in between classes. If you do this again, I promise I'm suspended you, man. I'm tired of seeing you. And you're like, hold up, let me explain something to you. No, shut up. You ain't explaining to me. Stop coming out my lunch room in between hours. And so he's trying to explain to him why he's in the lunchroom, and he's not trying to hear it because he saw him time and time afterwards. So he said, you got five minutes to get to class. If you don't get to class, I'm suspending you today. So I go over there and I talk to the young man, and I said, why are you skipping class? He said, my next class is a gym class. But it's a gym class with all severely um, enabled, disabled young people. The only thing wrong with me is my leg, not my mind. So they were put, the reason why he would come to lunch twice is because they were putting him in a classroom with young people who were severely retarded. And the only thing that was wrong with him was his leg. So what did that do to the self-esteem? the self-worth, and, how, and how, what, how many volumes does it speak that the security guard, who obviously got enough time in your schedule in between classes, to have a dialogue, wouldn't even do it. I don't even go to this school. He never met me, but he told me the story because all I did was ask him, why are you skipping class? When you muzzle young people, yeah, they go crazy, because they're human beings, they just never speak. Yeah, good, good point. We're actually pretty far past our scheduled time, but uh, I want to open, and I only got through half of the questions that I had on there, so that just means I got to come back to Milwaukee. We got to come back to Milwaukee. <laughs> but I, I do want to give the audience an opportunity to ask some questions uh, if you all have any. So if uh, anyone have any questions that they would like to ask the panel? Some of what you had to say today spoke uh, truth to power, and I think that's very helpful uh, as we think about these issues. Um, I want to ask each of you, um, I was raised without my father, and it had a dramatic impact on me. Fortunately, you know, and it has a dramatic impact on many of our men in our community. And I just wanted to wonder if, if you could reflect on uh, how you, if, first, if, if your dad was in your life, and if, if your dad wasn't in your life, how you navigate how you navigated that reality in the absence of your father, and what resources do you think need to be available in order to make uh, to have made that uh, navigation successful? And then, and then, secondly, I, I want to just say one other thing with respect to uh, the school system. I think one of the huge issues, and I had a charter school, in it, and I know uh, Dr. Thornton uh, is aware of me because I've worked he's worked with me in the past. Uh, we had a charter school, and one of the big issues that we had in our charter school is the leadership issue. Leadership is a critical issue, both at the, at the community, at the at the at the uh, instructional level, and also at the larger bureaucratic level. And one of the things that I found, particularly with the African American men that were in my charter school, it was more a function of compliance than education. So that we were more focused on what, to what extent these men would be, in, these young men would be compliant rather than would they be educated. And so I think that has a really important context for this. But the real issue that I wanted you to respond to is the issue around fatherhood and what you think that, that impact has had on you in your life. Get two people respond. Come here, brother. Um, personally, me, uh, I started out with just my mother and then. I lost my mother, and then it was me and my brothers. And um, I personally feel not having a father, people allow that to be a crutch. And they allow not having a parent to be a reason for failure. And as your society tells you, not having a father allows you to fail, and it's an excuse, and it's not. They allow it to hold you back. And me not having it, I realize that me not having my father should stop me. Me not having my mother should not stop me. And people saying that it's okay 
it's not okay. And uh, people, you sit back and be like, okay, I don't have my father, and it hurts. And people be like, it's okay to hurt. And when you fail, you're hurting, and that's why you're failing. And you sometimes you should take that hurt, and you should flip it into your need to succeed. And then you have a reason to pass on through high school. You have a reason to get your education. You have a reason to get a job. And I just think people should stop using it as a crutch. That's just how First of all, I would just like to say that um, um, from my experience of growing up, uh, uh, blood does not make you family. Um, and one thing I can say is that when, until I was 10 years old, um, my father went to prison. Um, and to this day, um, as far as I'm coming out and raising me, I don't think will ever happen um, again. Um, but it was definitely hard to know that I was with a single mom um, and then I had a, a lot of other family members that invested in me, but not having that father figure there to look up to when you were growing up um, um, was definitely a challenge. However, I realized that that does not give me a reason to do what my father did, okay? I understand that my father is human. I understand that my father made um, crazy decisions, decisions that I know he regrets till this day. But I made it an obligation for me and an expectation for myself and my family to let them know that I am going to be the man that I know you all want me to be. Um, and that, it was, that uh, is what stuck out the most. Um, but having a father later on in my teen years really resonated with me. It, it made me realize that you know, it, it would be great to have a mom and a dad. However, we have two dads in children's life, children's lives. We have two, uh, two mothers in children's life. We have guardians and uh, foster parents. So the idea of having a father is great. But let's just talk about two parents and have an idea that it doesn't have to be mom and dad, okay? It, it, you really need somebody that's going to be there to love you. All right, to respect you, to be there when you need them most. It is okay to have that mainstream society of a mother and father and having those biological parents and growing up in a big house and having a nice job. But where is the love? Where is the connection there when you can say, you know, I love you. Even though you aren't my child, I'm going to embrace every single success that you make and every single failure that become of you. Um, so one of those things that... Um, got me engaged in not having a father. One name that sticks out will be Adrian Thomas, and he's actually here today. Um, he is a man of his word and integrity and pride that I've never seen in my life from a black male um, living today. Um, he has instored so many things just from our first conversation of what do you want to be, okay? No, no, better yet, where do you want to go? And I'm going to help you get there. Mind you, I don't know this man from Adam. Okay, but, but growing with him, going to uh, uh, workshops with him, and having these meaningful conversations, and not necessarily saying, I'm gonna be a son, I mean, I'm gonna be a father, but saying that I'm gonna be here with you because you deserve somebody to be here is exceptional. And it definitely says pride and respect to those who barely know you. So having a father, yes, that's great. However, just having somebody in your corner means a million. Can, can, can you guys touch on um, what is an experience that um, has allowed you to figure out what your purpose is? Um, I think a lot of times um, uh, young black males aren't exposed to a lot of experiences that get them to figure that out. Um, and I think exposure is important. Um, you guys want to touch on that? Yeah, well, I want to start with you, Darius. Are you? Are you not Darius. And I identify myself because I'm kind of I've never said it. Um, I'm Milwaukee County Supervisor David Bowen. I just got elected. <laughs> but let me hear from you guys. Who was also an early undergrad? Well, I, I feel that most people don't find a purpose in life very soon, and that's, that's unfortunate. Um, Places like Urban Underground it have strong mentors that actually push people to find a purpose. And honestly, I didn't know what my purpose was. And I 
really still don't, but I see what I do and don't like in society. And maybe I feel my purpose is to, is to call it out. I feel that should be every, every youth purpose at this moment. And it's up to really the adults to actually push them to call it out, because you won't yell at an apple for being sour. I mean, you got to find the root cause of it, right? Or start from the beginning, start the apple tree over. So if you start the apple tree over, that's really starting with the youth. So if you start with the youth, maybe that will change society. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I would say that I have plenty of accomplishments as far as just right now. However, still that purpose, just like what you said, I still don't think that I have found my purpose. However, this is what I do know, who I am. And that's what I still try, instead, that's why I'm still trying to figure out who I am and who, what do I advocate for? And what I advocate for, does it benefit my society doesn't benefit the future generations that are going to come. One of the things that I realized before anything was that I was a black male. And that I had, you know, different shortcomings and everything. That's one thing I could focus on. And I could go from there, but not to forget yourself. That's one of the purpose. And with that, you could go further on once you know that, your identity. All right. I'm an athletic director, activities director. How do I get young black males to come out, get engaged in their school? What do I have to do to get them interested? In any sports, clubs, activities? I mean, I'm from Lily White Middleton. <laughs> so it's it hard. The first thing that, that I think is that needs to be said is that just because you're a Caucasian man doesn't mean they don't want to be interested. And sometimes people see their differences before they see how they're like, right? Um, that could not be true. The second thing is African American males respond a lot more to the culture of the activity, right? So it's not just that we play football, but can we talk smack while we play some football? Like, what's the culture of it? Sometimes the culture may say, no, I I'm not with that. And so looking at the way it's structured, and, and are there any leadership opportunities? When they see the other young people who are in that activity, when they're not in that activity, what's that dialogue about? How are they being treated? A lot of times you don't want to join something because of who's in it. I might love to do art, but if everybody in the art class is, you know what I'm saying, like, I ain't feeling you, I'm not feeling the art class either. Yeah. <laughs> And I thought about some stuff. Um, <laughs> I definitely think that getting them involved and engaged in the school in and of itself before sports, I think is very important. Um, and then that may trigger um, um, interaction between the, the students itself, the teachers, and also uh, coaches who may play those sports. If they feel more a part of the school community already, then they're going to, or most likely will play the sports because they also want to be a part of the team um, physically as well. Um, to want to have that pride and wear that um, the Middleton jersey on the shirt. And that's, I am part of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this institution. But if they don't already feel that already, then sports, I mean, they're not thinking about it. So how can you get them comfortable in a school environment first and then transcend that over to the sports? All right. Let's give a round of applause to our panel. Okay, this has been a very powerful dialogue, and we're going to conclude with a poem. And we we also have reception right after this, so we have some food for you all, some uh, some non-alcoholic beverages, and uh, just enough to get the networking going. Uh, but before I bring the poet up, I want to thank all of our community partners, uh, and please give them all a round of applause as I call their name. This is the office of Representative Wood Moore. Milwaukee Public Schools. Tyler Cedric. Urban Underground. Milwaukee Planning.
Academy Group. The Walking Partnership Academy. And the Young Enterprise and Society. Thank you all very much. Um, one other reminder, you all have a survey. Uh, this was brought to you all through funding from Open Society Foundation's campaign for black male achievement. Uh, they're the ones that flew me here. They're the ones who flew uh, Asa here. They're the ones who paid for this, uh, this beautiful facility and paid for the reception. Uh, so uh, we, we need you to fill out the survey so we can let Open Society Foundation know that they're getting a good return on their investment. We're gonna close it out with a uh, very powerful brother. I've seen his clips on YouTube. Uh, Kwabina? Kwabina. Sorry. Kwabina. Antoine Nixon. Please grace the mic. How y'all doing today, family? Man, we in this celebrating. Y'all said the news ain't here, the media ain't here, but you here, so you should be a little louder than that. How y'all doing today? said that if nobody came to see us, so since nobody came to see us, that means they're not celebrating us. So that means we have to celebrate ourselves. So I'm going to ask one more time, how y'all doing tonight? Make some noise. It's that somebody young who died too soon. I was in, I'm born and raised in Chicago, and I was looking at the story they had Ben Wilson on there. If you remember the story, I remember exactly when Benji got killed. I remember exactly that story. The, 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 the gymnasium was filled with people, and they got up, and everybody told how good Benji was. I'm 43 years old. I've buried enough friends that they can fill up this room. And we get together for those type of events, and we get up and we applaud and we say how good they were. But what I'm, I'm, I'm stressing this point is because we're sitting here right now, we got several young black men right now in this room who they took the time to, to put on stage and tell about the world. So they need to be applauded and honored. So one more time, I need you to give more love than you give it. Way, but I do have a few things I just have to say to you. It's very important that we acknowledge each other. Brothers on the streets do not acknowledge. Brothers on the streets acknowledge each other more than conscious brothers acknowledge each other. They got a way of talking to each other. I heard so many questions, and I hope when we get to the reception, you got more questions to ask in here. It's amazing when we in a room like this, the stories we need to tell each other. So the brothers up here, they were saying a number of things. The brother said, I still don't know my purpose, and I don't know my passion. What's your purpose and your passion? What is it that you will die for? What is it that you will die for? What, when you go to bed at night, keeps you up? What makes you toss and turn? See, the real question is, are we all in this room taking this personal today? Forget the funding. Stop, let me just be real. Forget the funding. You can get funded, your program get funded over and funded, but funding don't necessarily mean results. That don't necessarily mean people will graduate. That don't necessarily mean young men are, uh, young men are getting their lives together. The funding only means you got more money in your program. And where I come from, sometimes in the neighborhood, as we say, the ghetto or the hood, we know that it's a $5 million grant that went to some arts program. By the time it gets to us, it's probably, what, $10,000? And maybe after the $10,000, it's about five. And maybe you go get, what, an African drum and a piece of paint, and that's your own bus in that, right? So it's not funding. It's not about funding, it's about what's in here. What's your purpose and your passion? It's okay, little brother, that you don't know it right now because the main thing is you know this, you're still alive and you're still here. And I bet you you got some friends that's not here. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Clap your hands. Let's do some troops right now. What's some troops? I'm from Chicago, so I'm not a Green Bay Packer fan. That's one of the major troops. Don't do me now, stop it.
Here go another truth. Barack Obama is our president. It makes yeah. sense. And you know, a, a real truth before I get into the poem, if we don't teach our kids culture and history, we might as well put them in the ground now. Right. If we don't teach them that culture and history, and while all of you young people, how many high school and college students we got in here? Raise your hand. All right? Right, we got them in here. How many organizations in here? Raise your hand. In the front, put them on front street, superintendent, Congresswoman Gwen Moore, uh, Ashanti Hamilton just left, uh, David, uh, my good friend David Bowen is in there. Seek them out right now when you get a chance to. Go up to them and tell them, hey, you was in this room, and you told me if I got some issues I need to talk to. Here they go right here now. Pass your cards out. You ask some questions, dear brother, here go some young people. So get to them and ask them another question. And before I do the poem, my one thing I want to say to you guys, whatever you learn, you are accountable, uh, you should be able to teach. See, the real deal is, if you get up out of here, which it look like most of y'all gonna do, you know what's gonna be the most important thing? It won't be the college degree you get. It won't be uh, uh, the letters behind your name. I'm sorry, it won't be the letters behind your name. It won't even really be the money you make, because there's plenty of athletes who buy bad, who make, who make millions and come back and buy gym shoes and bikes for the hood. That's no problem. It's hustlers that'll buy gym shoes and everything for the hood. The real thing is, when you get yours, are you coming back to pull somebody else out? <laughs> Place wasn't full. If we want this place to be filled, then we gotta treat it like they treat it. See, it's all marketing. Their job is to get their message out. What's your job? See, their job is to say trap or die. Which one is your job? Are right, you gonna get out here and make your job happen? It's love to sit up here and have these conversations, but the real question is, are you gonna get out here and make your job and your mission happen? That's what's important. You find your purpose, you find your passion. Somebody in your neighborhood, I'm sorry I'm throwing it on you, but somebody in your neighborhood, they need you to come back and help them. Some family needs you to come back and help them. It's some little boy in a school, in a classroom, who has no idea what life is gonna be like, and he's begging you to come back. Yeah, we grew up without fathers. Fathers sometimes don't help us out. I lost my father when I was 11 years old. He's one of the biggest hustlers on the west side of Chicago. But I had men and women in the community who made sure I got on the right path. If you a man and woman here in the community, I don't need you to fund them, I need you to come and talk to them. That's what we need to do, all right? So with that being said, with that being said, I close with this. I had a poem I was gonna do called Hollow, but I think it's more important we look at it this way. Um, when I say do, y'all say better, do. Do I need the mic? Do I need the mic? When I say do, y'all say better, do. Do. I'm gonna speak to you from friends that's not here no more. I'm speaking for 41 friends and family that ain't never gonna see the sun again. I'm speaking for brothers who didn't duck fast enough when the bullets were coming. I'm speaking for little girls who they told, shh, don't tell nobody when they snuck in their room at night. I'm speaking for some of us who ain't never gonna make it out and you might be our only hope. I'm speaking for some of us that's waiting for somebody to come save us and we should be trying to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking for friends who ain't never gonna get to see the sun no more. Cause amongst you in this room, I'm telling you, believe me when I tell you, amongst you in this room, I need you to do this. A minister friend of mine in Chicago say, every day you wake up in the morning, you should look in the mirror and ask yourself, what's your life worth? He said, every day before you go outside, you should look in the mirror and ask yourself, what's your life worth? <clears throat> and before you leave the house, you should think of this. And I'm talking to everybody in the room, be you black, Asian, white, Latino, age, woman, don't matter. Amongst you in this room, I'm speaking to you. God forbid it should happen. God forbid it should happen, but if they close the books on your life and you never speak again, what are people gonna say about you? Mm -hmm. Like what they gonna do, write your name on the wall? Mm -hmm. Teddy bears in this shrine's this high? Mm -hmm. Put your face on the t-shirt? Some of them gonna smoke real good, drink till they pass out, and then three days the teddy bears in the shrine is gone. Mm -hmm. Your face on the t-shirt get washed off. Mm -hmm. The weed and the alcohol wear, they wipe your name off the wall and it's like you never ever existed. Mm -hmm. Or, you're gonna do something, and they're gonna talk about you 40 years from now like they do Dr. King and Malcolm X. So while you listening to me, I give you my story. Amongst you in this room, I'm speaking for friends that ain't gonna never be here. I'm speaking for boys who ain't never seen their father dead in their life. Cause when my life is over, you see when my life is over, you see when my life is over, please remember when we were all together. See, we were alone and I was doing this poem for you. If this be my last words. See, if this be my last words. See, if this be my last words, Red, if this be my last words, said, listen to me. If this be my last words, Red, if this be my last words,
first and listen to me and remember me. Celebrate me and venerate me with a million chocolate children holding incense. Dress them in liberation blood red for Malcolm. Place black coupes on their natural head and make sure they stand barefoot in the green earth soil. You remember me. Next, I want you to take 143,999 white doves to the atmosphere and ask them to save a place for me. And please, who's ever to do my eulogy? Please, who's ever to do my eulogy? Please, no phony preachers and no PhD speakers, no twisted psychologists who confuse and judge my not greed measuring sticks. Now I'd rather have flicks of my old school clip where we go all size and cut off blue jean shorts or plant alley sports or me money Gus and Claw with high top fades and fat gold chains and big old cell phones. And we were sitting on the front porch watching cars go by. And we all had smiles and better days ahead. You remember me? Oh, you gonna remember me? You gonna remember me? You go to the places I've been. Go to the teacher who said I never got out of high school until I got a college degree. Go to the man who said I wouldn't get off the block until I'd been around the world. Go to the police who beat me, threw me in the backseat of a cop, took me to another gang territory, and left me there to die. Go to anybody, everybody that's called me lazy, stupid, ignorant, and dumb, and talking about how many names they call me. I could not be broken. I'm like Antoine Fisher, and I am still standing. It ain't where you from, it's where you at. It ain't where you it's where you about to go. Oh, I swear you gonna remember me. Oh, you gonna remember me. Go to Gus Gray's site. Yeah, I know they shot you in the streets and left you love like a dog, but I told him your father never came around. Go to Booty Gray's site. I know they shot you nine times and left you there, but I told him you wanted to be somebody. Go to my father's Gray's site. Yeah, daddy, I know you hustled in the streets, but when I got my degree, I put it there because you didn't have a head stone and said, look, daddy, I did one better. Go to anywhere and everywhere that was some child in trouble. And look, go to my high school. They said I was dumb. And they just put me in EB classes. And they said I was talking too slow. And they said I was stupid. And they said I couldn't read a paragraph. Look, go to my high school, look, and let me say, look, I let it be said, I wrote a million words, hundred thousand words, get a school now, describe it, I said, I'm like it in metaphors, if he stands inspired by cannabis, and guess what? I still fail English class. You gonna remember me. You gonna remember me. I ain't no dummy. This ain't some black boy rap song. You ain't gotta come save me. I've been SOS saving myself for a long time. I swear you gonna remember me. Go to anywhere and everywhere that was some child in trouble. And I'm not lying when I tell you. Believe me when I say it, I got some blood on my head. I got some scars on my back. I swear I live in places where the sun don't shine. I'm telling you, in this room, my right hand to the God I know. You let it be said that I said in front of y'all that Ronald Reagan and George Bush need to be held accountable for the insurmountable murders in the stockpile of black and brown bodies. They never did time for drive-bys. They never came to the funerals of our friends. They never came when our fathers were leaving. They didn't come when the guns were blazing. They didn't come when the girls were dancing. They didn't come when the crack hit the neighborhood. They didn't come then, and they ain't coming now. So if you're going to wear that white T-shirt, you better wave it like a flag, like Katrina and SOS and say yourself, I swear to you, my word is bond. I bet you you gonna remember me. Go to anywhere and everywhere that was some child in trouble. And listen, when it's all said and done, do me a favor. Make your way to the west side of Chicago. Go up two flights of steps. Knock on door 208. It's a light-skinned lady with lips and eyes just like mine. Take a book of my poems, look her dead in the face, and kiss my mother. Remember my granny. Hold my sister. Pray for my mother. And tell my brothers, I tell my brothers we just misunderstood. Blood is on the hands and it can't be washed off. But I swear at night we say forgive us God. Oh, I swear at night we say forgive us God. Forgive us God, for we knew not what we did then and sometimes now, so no sad songs. Do me a favor, stand on the front of that building on the west side where I shot them slangs and I read them things and I read the right books and changed my life and you sprinkle some ashes there. Then go to California where the blue ocean and the golden sun saved my life and you sprinkle some ashes there. Then come on 13th and Atkins where I told the black boys, hey man, Pull your pants up, fix your shirt, hit your chest, and let the world know you was here. Sprinkle some ashes there. Then go to Tennessee, where I stood in the window. They shot Dr. King and sprinkle some ashes there. Then go to New York, where I stood in Harlem, where they killed Malcolm and sprinkle some ashes there. Then go down to Virginia, where the first Africans landed, and we were standing on auction block, and they was burning and lynching us like we was animals. And now some of us are burning and lynching each other like animals. And when you get there, do me a favor. <coughs> bring me some Pac. Bring me some Big. Bring me some Cold Train. Bring me some Big. <coughs> bring me an ink pen. Bring my grandfather's shoes, cause I got a long walk ahead of me. Tell the Ebo woman I'm coming, take my ashes, shake them like dice. I swear we're gonna get settled on this one. Mm -hmm. And send me home. Thank you. Oh. Oh.
about the style, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so we're going to continue here. Like I said, there's a lot of questions that, that we didn't get to ask, but what I'm going to do is, the questions I have on that sheet, I'm going to blast it out to everybody who are RSVP, and what I encourage you all to do is to take those questions and ask some other young black males those questions, because you see the types of responses that we get. And just like we have young black males on the stage, you, are, you all have young black males in your communities, you have young black males in your schools uh, that can answer those questions just like they did. Uh, so we're going to continue this dialogue well beyond this presentation. Let's go to the reception and meet some people. We're at the second event for our Say Yes Week. Uh, just wrapped up, a mile in my shoes, breaking barriers. Uh, we're here with my cousin, actually, and the moderator from the panel, dis uh, from the panel di discussion, Ivory Tosin. I guess he can introduce himself and kind of give a little background on uh, you know, everything that he, that he does day to day and what, you know, what, he, what he had going on today. Yeah, well, I really appreciate the opportunity to come to Milwaukee. And again, this is something different than anything I've ever been a part of. Uh, most of the panel discussions that I've moderated had the so-called experts on the stage, uh, but this time we put the real experts up there. And I think Milwaukee was a perfect place uh, to get it done. I think the YES organization was a perfect organization to be a catalyst to get people here. Uh, we had a very successful turnout, very powerful dialogue, and I think this dialogue is going to continue. So I thank all y'all for the work that you all are doing. I thank my little brother here. You know, he's a cousin, but you know, more like a little brother. So, uh, you know, they definitely doing some good work in the Milwaukee community. Hey, he, I couldn't have said any better. One thing I got from this, talk to the youth. Follow the yes. How you doing? My name is Jamie Elder. I'm the appointed director of urban development for the Wisconsin Department of Children and Families. Basically, we cover child welfare, uh, W-2, transitional jobs, child support, and foster care system. Uh, one of the things I work on in this, this area is basically employment, economic security for families and children. And I definitely support YES. I definitely uh, was working with uh, Khalif and everybody else to try to make sure we can work with the college students, make sure we find a path to career and employment, also entrepreneurship. So we support them supporting this community. Also, get in contact with me at 414-220-7082 or email me at jamie.elder at wi.gov. I look forward to supporting you any way I can. Uh, good program. Very good program. Gave us some insight on better ways to ameliorate or to improve the, the uh, school system for black African American boys. So I thought it was excellent. Gave me some resources. Gave me some more knowledge, some more stats. So it's good. It's something that we're going to be able to use further along in the Boys and Girls Clubs and other community organizations. I think it's great, man. We need to do more of this, keep it going. 